What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. I know things are looking a little different. Things are looking a little funky in here. First of all, the lighting, it's dark out. I usually don't make these videos at night, but man's is on the creep, right? Freaks come out at night, baby. Man's is out here working at night. We put the work in at the HQ. Thus, the lighting's a little funky right now. I got some weird lighting set up behind you. I know y'all are going to miss the orange finger pointing at you, letting you know what you're doing wrong. I wake up to that shit and it's like, Nick, get your, get your ass out of bed. I'm like, Zam. That painting played me. I bought it thinking it was a good purchase. Little did I know it would be my kryptonite. Got a whiteboard going because I can't, you know, I try to set things up on my Excel sheets on my computer and shit just gets a little a little hectic out here. Thus, we got a whiteboard. Your man's is crazy right now. I'm going ham in the paint. Anywho, it's week 15. It's about to be week 15. Hopefully, you won your first playoff matchup. Hopefully, you had a bye. Honestly, that's that's what we're that's what we're shooting for. Um and we're going to look at waiver wire pickups, baby. And the last couple of weeks, I have been, you know, sending you guys out those charts. The quarterbacks, tight ends, defensive streaming charts um, for those of y'all that downloaded them. That will be the first link in the description down below. So I'm not really going to dive too into the streaming options, right? But I do have these charts that I made for y'all in which uh, it, it kind of gives you a glimpse of who has terrible matchups, who has really good matchups going forward in the three streaming slots, quarterbacks, tight ends, defensive streams. Um, that being said... You're probably watching this on, it's Monday night right now. Uh, I don't think Monday Night Football's kicked off yet. I think we got like an hour left. So anyone in that game, I'm probably not going to put on this list. If I had to think of the game right now, the only ones that would come to mind would obviously be Latavius Murray if Dalvin Cook got hurt. Uh, probably no one else on the offensive side of things from Minnesota. Then we have Seattle. I'm interested in seeing what the wide receiver group looks like behind Doug Baldwin, because Doug Baldwin was just announced inactive. So, Doug Baldwin being out opens up not only Tyler Lockett, I'm, I'm expecting Tyler Lockett to have a pretty damn big game. He's already, he has nine receiving touchdowns on the year already, which is fourth highest in the NFL, which is crazy, because he only has like 58 targets or something. And uh, he should have a big game. That opens up, you know, the guys behind him. So, we have the David Moores, we have Jaron Brown, who's kind of not broke out, but he's had a couple big plays or big games over the recent weeks. So I'm kind of uh, excited to see what happens there. You know, um, maybe Doug Baldwin's injury is a little more serious than we thought. He misses multiple multiple games. And if that's the case, Doug Baldwin um, will miss time. Thus, David Moore or uh, someone like Jaron Brown or whoever might fill in, whether it's a tight end or, or whatever it is. Uh, Russell Wilson right now is fourth in the NFL in passing touchdowns, but he's 24th in pass attempts, which is fucking crazy. Either way, it's Monday night. We're going to get into waiver wire. If you missed today's vlog, I put out a new vlog today. I know I've only been doing them monthly, but we are going to ramp them back up. If you missed that, I highly suggest you check it out. It's all like the behind the scenes of building up the fantasy football brand, the industry, the business, the marketing, all that kind of shit, as well as me and my friends being assholes on the weekends because that's what we are. Um, anyways, I think you guys will enjoy that. So if you fuck with my fantasy football stuff, I would appreciate it if you go check out the vlogs and that will be the last video on the channel besides this one. So let's get cracking. So we're going to dive into the skill positions. And right now, the skill positions, the way I do this, everyone has to be owned in 55% of Yahoo leagues or less, because I'm not going to tell you guys that are owned in 80% of leagues. No reason for me to waste my time. No reason for me to waste your time. This is not an order of guys that I would like to have on my team first. This is an order of highest percentage owned. We're going to start off with the running backs, the ball carriers. First one is Doug Martin of the Oakland Raiders, owned in 52% of Yahoo leagues right now. I have no fucking idea how the Raiders pulled it off this weekend, but they beat the Steelers 24-21 um, on Sunday. Martin was was pretty much miserable for the most part in terms of efficiency. He ran for 32 yards on like 16 carries, so two yards a carry literally. But he found the end zone for the third straight game. Three rushing touchdowns in a row. Three games in a row with a rushing score. Uh, he's averaging 17 touches over those three games, over um, 15 touches a game over their last seven games. So clearly as soon as Marshawn Lynch went down, Doug Martin was said to be the next guy up, as John Gruden pointed out, and that has absolutely been the case thus far. I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Um, and for the first time in a long time, the Raiders will actually get a good matchup on paper. In week 15, they will be just three and a half point dogs as they travel to Cincinnati to play a horrible Cincinnati defense team overall, who is allowing the uh, single most fantasy points to the running back position on the year. Doug Martin getting the carries. Uh, he's scoring now. The Raiders don't look fucking miserable, I guess. I mean, it's debatable, but um, 
Doug Martin would be my first guy up here. He plays Cincinnati this week. He gets Denver the week after that. If I needed a running back uh, really desperately, I probably would use my number one waiver wire on him. Ido Smith is a guy I would not use my number one waiver wire on him. Of the Atlanta Falcons, 28% owned. I really want nothing to do with Ido Smith in my lineup, if I'm being quite frank with you, even as a Falcons fan. But the gap between him and the starting running back, Tevin Coleman, is not so glaringly obvious anymore. Um, it has actually crept to an interestingly close gap, if you want to put it, over the last few weeks. In week 13, not this not this Sunday, but the week prior to that, the uh, the snaps were split 55 to 45% in favor of Tevin Coleman, but Ido Smith actually outtouched him 8-7 to seven in that game. This Sunday, week 14, uh, the snaps were 33-32 to 32 in favor of Coleman, so still uh, a, a one-snap edge, but there's really no distinction between the two running backs anymore in terms of playing time and volume. The touch gap was in favor of Ido Smith. He actually outtouched Tevin Coleman 14 to 11. Ido Smith ran efficiently, ran for 60 yards on 11 carries. He tied a uh, season high with those 11 carries. He also caught three balls, which was good to see. He got four targets in the game. Didn't do much with that, only turned it into 14 yards. But the involvement overall is good to see. This Falcons offense is not one that you necessarily are targeting players in outside of Julio, of course. Um, but. When they're back home, when they're in the Dome, they run much more efficiently and much more smoothly, I guess if you want to say. And uh, it really could be anyone's backfield on a weekly basis, which is why, you know, I'm not really like sold on Ido Smith whatsoever and I'm not high on Tevin Coleman. Both of them will probably be ranked outside of my top. Actually, they might. one of them might be ranked inside my top 30 rankings this week because they do play the Cardinals at home. They will be heavy favorites in that one. So I could see them going pretty ground heavy here. No reason to really need to air it out because this Cardinals team is just so fucking bad on offense. They don't score any points. So that being said, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure where I'm going to have my rankings. Those the, My rankings come out every Thursday. Um, you only get my rankings if you are a Patreon subscriber. So if you have not yet checked out Patreon, um, it's where you can support your favorite creators because obviously YouTube don't pay a shit. We out here trying to eat YouTube stone those goddamn rice grains, bruh. Check me out, patreon.com slash bdge. I love you for that if you do so. If not, I still appreciate the support. Any thumbs up, comment, um, sharing this, subscribing to the channel if you are new. I love you with all my heart, baby. So Ito, not the highest on him. 28% on though. Um, so you can get him pretty widely available. One of my favorite pickups of this week is Kenneth Dixon of the Baltimore Ravens, 8% owned. The Ravens have, you know, continued to ride the Gus bus over the last four weeks, pretty much. They're going to ride it until the wheels fall off, and it looks like it's going to be to their detriment in that case. Dixon looked like the much better back on Sunday. Um, looking at Frank Stample's tweet here, he was breaking down the, nope, don't be calling me right now, peoples. Y'all know I'm in the HQ breaking shit down the big facts. Okay, Gus Edwards, week 14. 16 rushes, 67 yards, 4.2 yards per carry. Again, zero targets. Actually, incredible. he might break the record soon for most consecutive snaps played without a goddamn target. Gus Edwards, you are something else, my man. Ken Thixon, though, eight rushes, 59 yards, and a touchdown. 7.4 yards per carry. Caught a ball for 21 yards. I thought this was going to be a much more Ty Montgomery game. You know, you see KC on the schedule. Shout out fucking KC. Oh, my God, bro. I took the over on that game. So, the over on Saturday was 51 points, right? KC, Baltimore, 51 points. And I'm like, you know, Baltimore's defense is playing legit. I'm a little nervous about this. Um, I don't really know what's going to happen. They don't have Kareem Hunt anymore. So I'm like, eh, you know what? I, I want to take it, but I'm probably not going to. So I woke up the next morning and the over-under dropped from 51 down to 49. And I'm like, fuck this. I'm going all in because I nailed the Kyler Murray Heisman bet. I put $75 on Kyler Murray like the first week of September to win the Heisman because I've been watching that kid since like high school. Um, I remember when he won Gatorade Player of the Year, and I remember watching him when they were showing him the highlights, and uh, that kid was fucking something else, incredible, and he was even smaller at the time. I know he's tiny now, but watching him in high school, I was like, I hope he grows, because if he does, he'll be the GOAT, and now, since then, we've seen Russell Wilson um, kind of transform how you look at, at, at uh, quarterbacks, and I really, really, really hope Kyler Murray goes to the league, and not to, well, I hope he goes to the football league, not the major league, baseball, because uh, as of right now, he is a... MLB player, pretty much. He was drafted by the Athletics, and that is where he's supposedly going to go. But honestly, I think if uh, if his name starts popping up into first-round consideration and he's getting some good guaranteed money, I bet you he thinks twice. I really do. This kid is so, so fucking good on the ground, and his arm is so good. Um, so, yeah, I hit the Kyler Murray bet. So that was like uh, plus 700 or something. So I ended up like 7Xing my initial investment. And I was like, you know what? Let's fucking pay the mortgage this weekend. So we done did that, and we threw half of the money that I won from the Murray 
bet onto KC, the over 49, bought the hook, of course, so it was at 48 and a half. Um, and I was fucking scared, you know, they kept getting down to the red zone and then not scoring and missing field goals and shit. I'm like, I'm not going to hit this. I was going nuts. I was actually, I was actually pretty drunk yesterday. We went out for my friend's birthday for brunch. We were sucking down margaritas all day. And then like later in the afternoon games, we were watching that. And, uh, like I, I was, I was like beside myself. I was like losing my fucking mind. Right. Cause I got a lot of money on the game. And it, you know, if, if, if you, if you've ever gamble, if you're a sports gambler, like that shit just gives you straight anxiety. It's so bad for you. I actually want, actually, that's a good fucking idea. Someone needs to test this out. Someone needs to like strap up to one of those heart machines in a doctor's office and then like gamble on a fucking sports game. I bet you that is like worse for you, for your body than like 99% of shit that goes on in, in normal everyday life that people say is bad for you. Like, I feel like betting on sports is probably worse than, like, I don't fucking know. I don't really don't know. I don't even know why I'm on this tangent anymore. Anyways, yeah, we hit the fucking over on that game, baby. So, um, back to Kenneth Dixon. He looked really good in this one. Dixon ran for 59 yards, 8 carries, 7.4 yards per carry, touchdown. Again, it's the second game in a row that Dixon has actually gotten 9 touches. Exactly 8 carries in both games as well as a reception. So he's getting a little bit more involved. The more interesting part about this, the reason that I actually like Dixon a lot, is that looking at the snap split, in week 13, Gus had 43 snaps. Uh, Kenneth Dixon only had 19. Ty Montgomery was in the middle of them with 27. So it was Gus 43, Ty Mont 27, uh, Kenneth Dixon 19. Week 14, however, was a little bit different because Dixon closed the gap. Uh, Gus went down from 43 to 31 snaps from week 13 to 14, 43 to 31. Kenneth Dixon closed the gap by going from 19 snaps up to 23. So it was only an eight snap difference this time, whereas it was like a 24 snap difference in the week before that. Tymont only got 14 snaps from the backfield. He was out out wide or in the slot for five of the sna- five additional snaps. So um, Kenneth Dixon actually outplayed Ty Montgomery, and he closed the gap between himself and uh, Gus Bus. So, wouldn't surprise me if going forward, Dixon actually entered a near 50% snap split with Gus. They are playing Week 15 home against uh, Tampa Bay, so this could be uh, a game where they want a guy like Kenneth Dixon out because they're probably going to have to score points. At the same time, Dixon is a guy who has a skill set of a, a three-down player. So, when you have a guy like that, right, it's tough to... You know, it's tough to disguise Gus Edwards out there because he doesn't catch any fucking balls. But Kenneth Dixon, on the other hand, can catch the ball. Uh, he can run with the ball. And he's effective in all aspects of the game. So I wouldn't be surprised if they started pushing more touches and more snaps towards Kenneth Dixon. I know it is late in the fantasy season, so it's hard to expect much. But I actually think Kenneth Dixon might be a really, really sneaky good flex play this week. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if he found the end zone again. Um, so I like him this week. Elijah McGuire is another guy I like, depending on what happens with Isaiah Crowell. He left the game early on with a foot injury. Uh, he might have re-aggravated the toe injury that he came into the game with. Elijah McGuire took over as like the workhorse, right? He had uh, 17 carries, 60 rushing yards, caught three or four targets for 23 yards. He outsnapped the rookie, the 185-pound back Trenton Cannon, uh, 40 to 18. So that's not really a worry there. Elijah McGuire will take over as like the feature back here. Problem is, of course, uh, we don't know the severity of Isaiah Crowell's injury so far. We also like don't, uh, you can't really necessarily get excited about this Jets offense. It's like, oh, okay, I'll have a guy who's getting 18 touches in this Jets offense. Like, do you really want to trust that in your your fantasy semi semifinals? I mean, maybe, but you know, um, he will get the goal line work. He will get plenty of pass catching work. Um, they play Houston and Green Bay at home. Neither of them are great matchups for him. But yeah, if Crowell is out, then I think McGuire is uh, definitely flex viable. Another guy that I actually love, 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 that I don't think enough people are going to give enough love to is Darren Sproles of the Philadelphia Eagles. 6% owned. Now, I know I just heard reports or I just saw reports that Boston Scott is going to be signed. Now, Boston Scott got a little hype in the beginning of the year because he was on the Saints. And uh, people were excited about him getting used while Mark Ingram's out. Long story short, whatever, he's on the Eagles now because Corey Clement sprained his knee. He's going to be out for some games. Um, Sproles has looked pretty good since coming back, right? He's played in week 13 and he's played in week 14. Uh, And now we have, like I said, Corey Clement, who was taking the majority of passing down work out with a sprained knee. So he's going to miss some time um, and we'll have more information on Clement by the end of the day. But the fact that they signed Boston Scott is, uh, is not a good sign for his availability going forward. 
Um, Darren Sproles now, like I said, he's looked good over the last couple of weeks. He only ran the ball once on Sunday, but he did catch all three of his targets for 34 yards and a touchdown, and that is his second score in as many games. What's more telling is that Sproles actually outsnapped Josh Adams in this one, 23-21. to 21. Uh, I think Sproles has a good chance to lead this backfield in snaps, uh, and I think Boston Scott is not necessarily someone that we need to worry about taking away volume or anything like that. It's definitely more of a depth play because Clement was a passing guy, uh, passing down guy. Boston Scott is also kind of the same um, mix of skill set, I guess, if you want to say. So it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if Sproles ended up leading this backfield in snaps for the remainder of the game, and that's or the remainder of the season. That's something that we've seen in this Philly backfield over the recent years where Sproles has been healthy and good to go and on the field. Sproles is always mixing in, whether it's running work, two-minute drill, passing work. Like, he's always utilized, like, as much, if not more, than any other running back in this backfield. What I love about him in Week 15 is they're going to be playing against L.A. Now, L.A. looked like fucking cheeks against the Bears this weekend. I get that. But cold weather, obviously, we know to fade this offense in the cold weather, Goff, whatever. They're going to be back in L.A., so they're going to be at home. They're obviously going to be putting up points. Philadelphia, on the other hand, has to travel across cross country. Now, they're going to be, I think they're going to be in catch-up mode for a lot of it. I think the Rams are going to be good, again, you know, scoring back at home. They'll be fine. Philly is going to have to catch up. Who is going to be the guy on the field when they're playing catch-up? It'll be Darren Sproles, man. So I really like him in PPR leagues for Week 15 as a sneaky, sneaky, sneaky play. Um, last up on this list, uh, I'm not really sure if I even care about these two guys, but it's uh, Chris Ivory, Isaiah McKenzie of the Buffalo Bills, because LaShawn McCoy left the game after the first drive, tweaked his hammy. Josh Allen is the best running back on the Bills right now. That is, it's bar none. He's, he's rushing for 100 yards a game, which obviously creeps away a lot of the opportunity that these other running backs have. McKenzie looked good. Ivory is going to get the carries there. Um, they play against Detroit at home this week. So it's actually a very good matchup for um, for all intents and purposes. For all intents and purposes. So, uh, you know, keep an eye on the reports for McCoy. I'm not necessarily getting excited about Ivory or McKenzie, who was more involved in the passing game. But I just figured I would throw them out here for y'all because that's what we do in this free agency bull spit, right? Let's move on to wide receivers. Those are all the running backs I have on the board for y'all. Before we do that, I want to thank today's sponsors for the video. Y'all know who it, is, who it is. It's FantasyJocks.com, the industry leader for any equipment gear that y'all need for your fantasy league. Whether it's football, basketball, baseball, don't matter. They have it all covered. Championship belts, championship rings, championship trophies, draft boards, whatever, 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 completely customizable to your league. You can get whatever shit you want engraved on here. If you want your league's name on here, you could do that. If you want the the past champions of the last five years, you could do that. They got it all. They're fucking partner up with BK, baby. Have it your way. Anyways, take 10% off of your purchase using promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP. FantasyJocks.com, thank you for sponsoring today's video. Make sure you check them out. Again, link and description and promo code and everything will be in the description down below, whatever, whatever. While you're down there, make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you're enjoying this show. I'm fucking on another level today. I don't know why this is happening. We're going to move on to wide receivers now, though. <clears throat> Let me make sure you're still running. Running, running, and running, running. Yeah, we do cheap. Cool. Uh, okay, first up on this list is Dante Pettis, owned in 46% of leagues. Also, uh, Justin Jackson, running back for the Chargers, had a down week. I know, like, on the Thursday video, I said I would have started Jackson over Eckler, but then if you watch my Saturday video, the DFS video, I said I backtracked on that, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to play Eckler over Jackson this week. Turned out to be the right call. However, Jackson's owned in, like, 56% of leagues, so he doesn't technically make the list, but if he is unowned, Eckler is banged up. He might miss this Thursday game because they're on a short week. Um, Melvin Gordon, again, is also banged up. So on a short week, they might not push him. So Justin Jackson needs to be owned because he might end up being the only back in that Chargers backfield ready for their Thursday night game against the Chiefs. So that would almost by default make him an RB1. Get Jackson if he's available. Wide receiver is Dante Pettis. San Francisco 49ers, 46% owned. Second round rookie is really out here doing his thing, yo. Um, on Sunday, he scored again, making it his fourth tug. In the last three games, this man is finding pay dirt every week. Week in, week out, Pettis has been doing his thing for the last three weeks. He is averaging four receptions, 85 receiving yards, and like I said, four touchdowns over the last three weeks. That is some good goddamn numbers. Um, with Pierre Garçon not even back at practice yet, um, even in a limited fashion, Pettis should remain the top option on the outside. Obviously, George Kittle is the GOAT. 
up the middle, but they do need to stretch the field a little bit. Pettis is a guy who can do that. So Pettis has been uh, ridiculously consistent as of late, putting up points every single week. Um, great route runner. The Niners get a matchup with the Seahawks at home in week 15. Pettis played the Seahawks two weeks ago in week 13. Went for 129 yards and two touchdowns. I like his chances of another big game. Dante Pettis, move over to number two, Curtis Samuel of the Carolina Panthers. 30% owned. I'm really surprised he's this available, that he's available in 70% of leagues. While on the flip side, Devin fucking Funches is owned in 70% of leagues and only available in 30% of leagues. People, time to wake up. Funches is like the fourth or fifth wide receiver on this depth chart. And that's not my fucking opinion. That's the big facts only. If you look at snap chart, if you look at snap counts, if you look at the targets, if you look at the volume, Funches is no re- longer a part of their offense for the most part. Um, he's off the injury report, and since he's been off the injury report in the last two weeks, he's been far out snapped by Bur- both Curtis Samuel and DJ Moore. Samuel has played on 92% of the team's snaps over the last three weeks. He's a full time player for the Carolina Panthers right now. Samuel is a superb athlete, blazing 4.3140 yard dash speed. He was basically a hybrid coming out of Ohio State. Like, they didn't know if they were going to use him as, like, a running back, as a wide receiver. And I wish they would run the ball with him a little more, uh, give him some more, like, fantasy upside, because every time they do, I feel like he ends up breaking it for, like, 25 yards. They should give him more end-arounds, just given his speed. But they haven't really been doing that. Regardless, he's been very involved in the passing game. Uh, He got eight targets on Sunday, ended up with 80 receiving yards. Uh, which gives him 19 targets over the last two weeks and a 23% target share on this Carolina offense who um, obviously are going to be without Greg Olson for the rest of the year. So since Greg Olson has been gone, Samuel has played a really big part of this offense. He has jumped Devin Funches in the the pecking order. Um, It's only good things to go. And he has topped 80 yards receiving in both of those games. So he's getting the volume, he's getting the production, and there's no reason to think it is going to stop. He gets the Saints and then Atlanta, both at home. Two really, really good matchups for fantasy wide receivers. Curtis Samuel. Next up on the list, Zay Jones, 21% owned. Huge disappointment this week, obviously. uh, And also, not surprisingly, just given the consistency of that Buffalo Bills offense outside of Josh Allen's rushing ability. Uh, But the process was there, all right? Nine targets on Sunday, which gives him nine plus targets in three of his last four games. He has a 26% target share over the last two weeks. He's seeing a ton of the volume that's coming by way of Josh Allen's big ass hands. Uh, But we've also seen his floor, of course, which is never fun when your championship or your semifinals are on the line. They do get a Detroit team at home in week 15, though, who has been beat by athletes um, similar to Zay Jones uh, on numerous occasions in 2018. So Jones is the type of player that is very capable of beating a Detroit Lions defense. Uh, They're going to be without Ziggy Ansah, so they don't have much of a pass rush going on. Uh, I think think Zay Jones probably finds his ground a little bit, keeps the volume going, and has much more production coming out of this one. So I like say Jones this week. I'm not like super high on him, but not the worst. John Ross, Cincinnati Bengals, 9% owned. So John, John, John Ross, this is what I tweeted out uh, today. John Ross over the last five weeks has low key been kind of amazing and kind of horrible. Uh, the good is that he has scored a touchdown in four of his last five games. And I feel like a lot of people probably didn't know that he has six touchdowns on the year, but four of the last five games, his average depth of target is near 17 yards. So he's scoring touchdowns. He's getting deep balls. However, he's not like making he's not getting any production outside of getting into the end zone. He hasn't caught more than three passes in a game in any of those five games. Um, I'm talking about the last five games. I don't think he has on the entire year, but if we're looking at just the last five weeks, right? Scored four or five weeks. But he has not caught more than three passes in any of them. And he's actually only caught two or fewer in four of those five. He has not gone over 39 receiving yards in any of those games. He has a 40.7% catch rate. That would be a com- The reason that would be so low is one, because the average depth of target is really long. Obviously, the deeper the passes are, the less likely that the completion rate is going to be. Two, the fact that he's playing with a backup quarterback. So deep passes from a backup quarterback don't necessarily mean a good thing. He's also dropping balls at an 8 to 10% rate, which is not good um, over the long span. His yak, he's not making plays after the catch. Yak of 1.3. So looking at John Ross, uh, he's definitely way more of a desperate play. But they do play Oakland at home. Um, They are favored, so they are expected to put up points, I guess, if you want to say. I'm not high. I'm not excited about him, but he's someone that you can throw into your lineup because he's been doing really well lately. Number five, and this is probably my two of my most intriguing guys on this list. Um, These are the last two guys on this list pretty much. It is the wide receiver duo in Denver. 
Deshaun Hamilton, the rookie, and Tim Patrick. Now, I'm a big fan of Deshaun Hamilton. Hamilton is a guy that I own a lot of in my dynasty leagues because I liked him coming out of college. And now with Emmanuel Sanders out, Hamilton has taken over as a slot guy. Um, he is a full-time player now. He well, he has been. Um, he played on 72 of 74 of the Denver's offensive snaps this week, 97.2%. Look at Deshaun Hamilton's player profiler, profile. Um few things stand out. 72nd percentile yards per reception is breakout age. So he has been doing his thing for a while. He was uh, young when he kind of came on the scene in college. His agility score is high. The rest of his stuff is not really that high. So um, in terms of being like a freak athlete, Deshaun Hamilton is definitely not there, but you don't really necessarily need to be that in today's NFL from the slot. And he ran 72% of his routes from the slot. Uh, he ended up with Seven catches on nine targets for 47 yards and a touchdown. So nine targets converting into 47 yards is never really a fun thing. That's 5.2 yards per target. But the volume surely is there. And uh, I think he could have had a much bigger day if Case Keenum, you know, stopped being a fucking dick all the time and throwing the ball all over the place. But point is, he's getting the volume. Um, he was actually second on the team in targets. And he was behind a guy named Tim Patrick, not Cortland Sutton. So Cortland Sutton uh, clearly is not going to be the redraft factor that we hoped he would be now that Emmanuel Sanders is gone, Demarius Thomas is gone. It ain't there. He still can't separate. Uh, still a big target, like a red zone guy, but that's not, that's like the worst piece of analysis ever. There are guys like the Josh Doxson, right? Red zone guy. Doesn't fucking mean anything. Um, Cortland Sutton, yeah, he needs to progress as a player first. So I will take a guy like Deshaun Hamilton, who will have the easier matchups on a week over week basis. And not necessarily need to have a great skill set in order to produce out of the slot. Let's get Tim Patrick, though. He went 7 for 85 on Sunday. He also rushed once for 11 yards, so 96 total yards. Caught 7 of 10 targets. You look at his raw measurables. Looks pretty good. College dominator rating in the 76th percentile. He, he was an undrafted free agent. He's 25 years old, so like something there is a red flag saying, like, how come, like, why is he just doing this stuff now? There's got to be more to it. His raw metrics are pretty good, though. His weight-adjusted speed score is almost in the 80th percentile. His burst score and catch radius are both above the 82nd percentile. Um, and he played on 86% of the snaps on Sunday. And that's actually more than Cortland Sutton played on. I know he kind of left, I think, a little bit with some kind of injury, came back in and whatever, but he's been playing a pretty good amount of snaps um, multiple times. Or Sorry, there's text messages coming up on my screen. Uh, but he's played in, in a good amount of snaps over the last few weeks, um, in concurrence with Cortland Sutton. So, Tim Patrick is a guy that you need to keep your eye on. I would much rather have Deshaun Hamilton right now, but I think uh, we'll see what happens here because they do get two really good matchups over the next two weeks. We have Cleveland at home, and then they're at Oakland. So, I think Deshaun Hamilton could easily finish as you know a top 36 wide receiver, fantasy wide receiver over the, the remainder of the fantasy season. Uh, if not better, top 30 maybe, because I think he's going to keep getting the volume. And we know Case Keenum loves to throw at the slot. We saw it with Thielen last year. We thought, saw it with Sanders all this year. Um, so it should be interesting to see Deshaun Hamilton. He's one of my favorite waiver wire pickups for this week due to the Cleveland-Oakland matchup tandem that the Broncos have on their schedule to end the year. Um, and then that's really it. I mean, two other guys I don't really feel like wasting my breath on because they're on this chart like every other week because they suck and then they're good and then they suck and then they're good. It's Kenny Stills and Robbie Anderson. Both of them are benefiting from getting their quarterbacks back, right? Their quarterback bike, Ryan Tannehill, bike in the lineup. Sam Darnold, bike in the lineup. Both of those guys play better with their starting quarterbacks. Uh, both are owned in like 20 to 30% leagues, so they are widely available. They both play in below average offenses, whatever. That's my analysis. I kind of hate both of them and I won't want to start them, but figure I'd throw them out there because some of y'all are in them deep leagues and need some player players. That's going to wrap up running backs, wide receivers. Again, guys, if you want to um, grab the quarterback, tight end, defensive streaming charts, that will be down below. It'll be the first link in the description. While you're down there, I would really appreciate a thumbs up, a subscribe. If you are new to the channel, you could share this if you think it's going to help other people. Obviously, you ain't trying to help the other people in your league, but y'all get the point. I just, a little bit of engagement goes a long way in my heart and soul. Speaking of my heart and soul, go check out my vlog, guys. Please, I would very much appreciate that. That's going to wrap it up for this. Um, quarterbacks, just a really, you know, low-key, high-key, I guess, high point of view looking down. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place because messages won't stop popping up on my screen. Um, Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson are the top quarterback ads this week. 
Ian Thomas is a good tight end ad this week after what he showed with Cam Newton on Sunday for the for the Panthers, obviously. You got taking over Greg Olson. Um, and then defensive streamers, as always, you look for home teams that are big favorites in the game with low over under totals. That should get the job done. I'm out of here. Thank you all for the time. I love you as always.